Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's update on COVID-19 in Alberta. With us, as always, is Dr. Dina Henshaw, Chief Medical Officer of Health for the province. Dr. Henshaw will provide a brief update, and then once we are done, we will open the floor to questions. Thank you, Tom, and good afternoon, everyone. Before I begin today, I want to address a number of questions that I have heard about testing for government officials. A priority list for expedited testing was approved by Cabinet this spring. Essentially, tests for a few officials who are crucial to the pandemic response are completed as quickly as possible. It ensures that anyone who is contagious is identified quickly to avoid disruption to the pandemic response. This is standard best practice for emergencies and similar approaches are utilized in other jurisdictions. It ensures that health services and government can keep functioning during a pandemic. You may recall the two times that I appeared at a press conference remotely. The two times that I had symptoms, I personally had tests on an expedited basis to ensure that any necessary follow-up would happen swiftly if I had tested positive. No family members, friends, or colleagues of these individuals are given access to priority testing. This is simply for a small number of key decision makers and it occurs very rarely. I have also heard on another topic a lot of questions about whether we should and how we can safely celebrate Halloween this year. So I want to take a moment to talk about this as well. As a parent, I know this can be an important and fun time for every member of the family. I have always loved the fact that we open our doors to our neighbours to celebrate this holiday. And to me, it embodies the community-oriented spirit that we need so much right now. As a public health physician, I also know that it can be tempting to let our guard down during those times when we are having the most fun. We have posted tips and advice online to keep this Halloween safe. I'd encourage anyone who is planning activities to review this information. However, there are a few key pointers that I'd like to flag now. First, please avoid large gatherings. This is not the year for Halloween parties. Keep your celebrations with just your household and cohort, no more. Let's keep it small and let's keep it safe. If you or your kids are feeling sick, even with mild symptoms, please stay home and please don't hand out candy. Halloween is for bringing home treats, not viruses. With respect to the question of whether or not trick-or-treating should still happen with this increase in our case numbers recently, I believe that trick-or-treating is a safe activity if done outdoors and within a household group. To keep things safe, Make sure your child wears a non-medical mask, either under their Halloween mask or as a part of their costume. Keep distance from others while you're trick-or-treating. Encourage your kids to call out trick-or-treat from the sidewalk instead of ringing the bell or knocking. If you're giving out candy, wear a non-medical mask and find creative ways to hand out pre-packaged candy only, for example by using tongs or a grabber. I am encouraging people to have fun and utilize other creative solutions like building a candy slide. When kids get home with their candy, make sure they wash their hands and disinfect packages before they sample their treats. This year, we will need to do things a little differently, but we can have a safe Halloween if we all take reasonable precautions. Turning to today's update, more than 20,000 Albertans have now recovered from COVID-19 about 500 more since my last availability on Tuesday. Currently, 112 people are in hospital with 18 cases in the ICU. As I've mentioned, this is something that we continue to watch very closely, not just the numbers, but also the health system's capacity at large, including staffing and other supports. We completed more than 14,300 tests in the last 24 hours and identified 427 new cases of COVID-19. Our provincial positivity rate yesterday was 3%. Turning to schools, there are active alerts or outbreaks in about 9% of all schools, with a total of 561 cases. There are 101 schools with an outbreak, including 27 that are on the watch list, with five or more cases. 
I also want to alert you to a couple of outbreaks that will be posted online tomorrow. An outbreak has been declared at the Edmonton General Continuing Care Centre. A total of 23 cases have been linked to this outbreak, including 19 residents. My local colleagues have assured me that all residents and patients on the affected units and all staff who have worked on these units have been tested. Outbreak protocols have been implemented to limit the spread and protect the health of everyone involved. There is also an outbreak at the Calgary Correctional Centre. To date, 24 cases are linked to this outbreak, including 20 inmates. Centre-wide testing and isolations are in place and outbreak protocols have been implemented. It has now been two weeks since we announced voluntary measures within Edmonton Zone. As I mentioned on Tuesday, we saw a decline in the rate of growth in the data to the end of last week, which is a positive early sign. It is proof that collectively, by making simple changes to our everyday lives, we can reduce transmission and bend the curve. It is another reminder of our collective power. But unfortunately, this is not a cause for relaxation. In the past few days, our numbers have risen again. And while I do not have an R value, at this time, case numbers have recently been rising again in a concerning way. As a result of this rise in cases and the current and future need for hospital beds, Edmonton Zone is activating new surge capacity measures in order to support safe patient flow through hospitals in the area. With the rise in COVID-19 cases, we are seeing an increase not only in our hospitalization numbers, but also an increase in the number of frontline healthcare workers who are off due to quarantine restrictions. Because of this, AHS has made the decision to postpone non-urgent surgeries and some ambulatory care clinic visits in the Edmonton zone. Urgent, emergent and cancer surgeries will continue. Edmonton zone remains committed to meeting surgical targets for the year and will reschedule surgical cases as soon as possible. AHS is taking these measures to ensure that we are able to provide care to those who most need it. While these health system impacts are primarily in Edmonton at the moment, Calgary and other parts of the province have also seen a rise in cases recently. The leading source of exposures for active cases right now is close contacts, and many of the cases that we are seeing now are the result of spread over Thanksgiving when families gathered together. People did not mean to spread COVID, but it is a reminder that social gatherings where distancing and masking are not used consistently are a significant risk for spread. I want to be clear, I am very concerned about the rise in numbers. We are looking seriously at the spread and determining what our next steps should be. I know that after more than half a year, we are all tired of COVID-19 restrictions. But COVID-19 is not tired of us, so we must remain vigilant. Today, I'd like to take a moment to talk about the impact of COVID-19 on younger Albertans and why this is something that we all need to take seriously. In no way are young people the sole cause of the rise in cases that we are seeing. However, adults in their 20s and 30s are the largest group of active cases we have today. Much has been made of the fact that younger people, especially those without underlying health conditions and under the age of 40, have a low chance of dying or experiencing a severe outcome. This is absolutely correct, but these are not the only risks that come with contracting COVID-19. As T.S. Eliot said, life is long. We do not yet know the long-term consequences of getting infected. We are starting to get some clues from findings from other countries that show even low-risk people could face prolonged recoveries and long-term health risks from a COVID-19 infection. There is growing evidence that some people are experiencing longer-term COVID-19 symptoms or long COVID after their initial infection. These long-term symptoms vary in severity and duration. A recent study in the United Kingdom followed the health of 201 low-risk patients with an average age of 44 who were diagnosed with COVID-19. Only 18 of these patients needed acute hospital care for their initial COVID-19 infection, so this is a group of patients who had relatively mild disease. 
Despite this, the study found many of these people still had symptoms like fatigue, headache, shortness of breath, or muscle aches four months after their initial symptoms. The Centre for Disease Control has also reported that heart conditions are associated with COVID-19 illness and that these can affect younger people, including athletes, and that the long-term risks are unknown. Similarly, data from the COVID symptoms study, which uses an app that enables millions of people throughout the United States, United Kingdom and Sweden to share their symptoms, suggests that one in 10 people with COVID still have symptoms after three weeks. While we do not yet have Alberta specific data, we are working with Alberta Health Services to develop pathways for care for those who have prolonged symptoms and to gather data on how many Albertans are experiencing this prolonged illness. In short, while it feels like we have been facing COVID-19 for an eternity, in terms of the scientific method and understanding of how this illness affects the body in the long term, these are still early days. The virus does not discriminate and it can have long-term and potentially devastating impacts on people's health. No one of any age can take COVID-19 lightly. You have heard me speak before about my concerns on the idea of herd immunity from natural infection, and I want to reinforce that concern again. First, those infected can have long-term risks we don't fully understand, as I have just explained. Second, our age-specific hospitalization rates from COVID have not changed significantly over time, and some younger people with COVID-19 still need hospital care. If we let the virus spread freely, even if we could limit spread just to younger groups, there would be a terrible impact on our acute care system. Finally, we are interdependent and interconnected. There is no way to successfully age segregate our population and increased community spread puts our elders and those with chronic conditions at risk. We are all in this together and our best and only protection, both from COVID and the impacts of restrictions remains each other. These days right now are our chance to avoid stronger measures. We need to take it. Alberta, we have brought down our infection rates before and we can do it again. If you were waiting for that moment to take COVID seriously, to start going the extra mile, this is it. Tomorrow and this weekend, let's all be extra careful and extra cautious. We are all in this together and we are powerful together. Thank you and I am happy to answer any questions you may have. All right, we'll go to the phone now. We have a very full queue, so please limit it to one question and we will get through as many as possible. Moderator, could you put through the first caller, please? First is Audrey Navo with Radio Canada. Go ahead, Audrey. Hi, Dr. Inshaw. I would like to know, as we have seen Minister Tracy Allard uh, being infected with COVID from someone um, maybe outside the legislature, um, do you think that it should be mandatory to wear masks in the legislature, notwithstanding if you have a cohort with staff? Should it be mandatory at all times? The recommendations that we have in place for workplaces are, of course, a recommendation that uh, masking be used more consistently. Uh, however, that, that question of mandatory or not is really, again, up to the uh, individuals who oversee the functioning of the legislature. And so I would defer to them to make that final decision. But ultimately, again, I do encourage people in workplaces to wear masks Again, whenever they're not seated at a, a workstation distance two meters from others. Operator, could you put through the next caller, please? Operator, could you put through the next caller, please? Yeah, sorry, next is uh, Alex McClaig with Chat TV. Go ahead, Alex. Thanks. Um, Dr. Henshaw, we've seen and here in Medicine Hat, uh, obviously, the large number of cases in Brooks, cases uh, in the western portion of Saskatchewan, to the east of us, uh, Lethbridge, and uh, we've seen a resumption of a number of activities, though not, not normal here in the city. Can you, is there any insight into why we seem to, uh, the city seems to maintain a, a fairly low number of, of COVID cases? I don't have information specifically about Medicine Hat, but what I can say we've observed in places across the province is 
that often, uh, especially in a, a smaller community, they can maintain very low rates for a long time, but it does take just one or two spreading events where you have one person who's infectious who attends perhaps a large gathering to quickly catapult into many cases. So whatever is happening in Medicine Hat, whatever is working really well, I would encourage those who live there to keep up their diligence and know that because there are, as you say, some increases in cases in those surrounding communities, there's the possibility that there could be someone infectious without knowing it who does attend a gathering. And so it's just a reminder to make sure that all of those measures that need to be in place on a regular basis are in place even in places like Medicine Hat where current numbers are relatively low. Operator, could you put through our next question, please? This is Kevin Nimick with CTV. Go ahead, Kevin. Hi, Dr. Hinshaw. On Tuesday, you reported an outbreak in a sport cohort in Edmonton. Your office has repeatedly said they could not even reveal what sport this concerns, let alone what association or team it concerns. We've been told this would breach patient confidentiality. Can you explain this rationale and why COVID outbreak information is being withheld from the public when it could help people make informed decisions? One of the principles of the reporting process for outbreaks is that we report information to let people know about general risks and where we're seeing these outbreaks. Uh, but when we start to get into specifically naming a particular group, uh, that actually can have the opposite effect of what we intend and it can unfortunately keep people from presenting for testing if they have symptoms. It can make people reluctant to participate in contact tracing if they feel that, that details that might personally identify them are going to be posted online. So we do uh, work very hard to strike that balance between protecting the privacy of individuals who are impacted and providing general information to the public about what kinds of risks we're seeing in our population in Alberta. And so that again is, is why we release some information but not details because we do want to make sure that we are uh, protecting those who are working with us to prevent spread and that we're not creating a disincentive for them to perhaps go underground with disease. Operator, could you put through our next caller, please? Next is Jason Herring with the Calgary Herald. Go ahead, Jason. Good afternoon, Dr. Hinshaw. Uh, with Calgary now seeing a surge in cases that, that seems to be to be similar to what Edmonton experienced a few weeks ago, I'm wondering if the province is considering similarly introducing voluntary restrictions for Calgary. We are looking at multiple options for response to our provincial situation and there have been no decisions made yet about what that might look like. Uh, of course, as you say, we have seen a concerning rise in Calgary lately and we are looking at the, the numbers and the trends there to see if there's anything in particular that we can point to that's causing it. At this time, again, we don't have anything specific beyond those same trends that we are seeing across the province where social gatherings are a risk factor for large uh, spread um, events and also making sure that uh, we, we consider that local epidemiology and local partners before we make any decisions. Operator, could you put through the next caller, please? Next is Julia Wong with Global News. Go ahead, Julia. Hi, Dr. Hinshaw. You spoke about younger Albertans earlier, and you've also previously said that work was being done to communicate to younger Albertans better. But to the best of my knowledge, it doesn't seem like there's been any changes to the kinds of messages that are going out to them and the distribution of those messages. So what, if anything, is being done differently to get the message out to this particular age group? And if nothing has changed, why not? You know, we've been working with our communications teams and with colleagues across the country to try to understand how to best communicate with that particular group. I think it's it's challenging for people in a younger demographic where they personally don't have the same high risk of severe outcomes. And also often people in that demographic, uh, again, it's a time of life where social interactions and spending time with friends um, is a really critical part of uh, an active supportive social environment and so we're wanting to make sure that that we think about how best to communicate with a message that goes beyond simply saying you know don't get together with friends but we're wanting to work on how we can 
give information about how to safely gather and, and how that might be uh, delivered in a way that, that resonates more with that age group. So I mentioned before we have been working um, with a grant funded group on focus groups to understand what kinds of messages resonate. There's some surveys that are in the works to try to help us understand what kinds of messages and what kinds of platforms will be more effective. But unfortunately, there is no single solution. We know across the country there have been many attempts to try to reach out more effectively to that younger demographic and no one has yet found an approach that seems to work really well. So again, we are continuing to look for options and continuing to look for partners to work with who can help us with this particular demographic. But ultimately, it really does boil down to making sure that um, we do keep trying and we do keep uh, adjusting as needed and we will continue to do so. Operator, could you put through the next caller, please? Next is Jesse Wisner with Global TV. Go ahead, Jesse. Hi, Dr. Hinshaw. Uh, we've seen some Alberta doctors publicly call on the province to immediately mandate and enforce restrictions on gatherings as well as on places where you can't wear masks, like gyms and indoor restaurants, uh, saying we can't be reactionary to those numbers. We need to be proactive. With the increase already in COVID numbers, has anything changed with the barometer of when the province puts in restrictions? What's your response to their concern and could we see restrictions sooner? I appreciate the voices that are uh, that are out there and, and articulating their perspectives on the way forward. Uh, and I think the, the COVID response, as I said before, is a response that is not easy. There is no one single path that is the, the right way at all times. And so I think what we're looking at now, as I said earlier, is monitoring our acute care system, monitoring the impact of COVID cases and those that need hospital care, and understanding again as we're seeing these trends and cases what we might see in the coming weeks as we know that hospitalizations and ICUs are a lagging indicator but any action that we take uh, has consequences both positive and negative and those are things we do need to weigh out so we we are watching as I said very carefully we appreciate the perspectives that are shared by stakeholders and again there's no one perfect path and we're trying to do our best to balance COVID-19 impacts and the impacts of restrictions and trying to find the best path forward that um, helps us to minimize both of those kinds of harms. Operator, could you put through our next caller, please? Ashley Joanna with Post Media. Go ahead, Hi, good Ashley. Afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, thank you for taking my call. I'm hoping you can tell us specifically who is on the list that's been created to qualify for expedited testing and what specific parameters were used to, to make the list? The list was a list of criteria rather than a list of names. Uh, and the decision was made by cabinet very early in the pandemic response many months ago. And the criteria that were put forward were individuals who were essential to the pandemic response. So weren't able to easily be replaced as an individual in that response. Uh, that they were symptomatic or exposed to a case of COVID and that, um, again, their, their core uh, functionality in that pandemic response was one of those parameters. In terms of the decision making, that was not something that I was involved in, but again, that was a cabinet decision. And with respect to the number of people, my understanding is, again, that it's a very, very small number that have been uh, provided access to that expedited testing and any more details in terms of a specific list again uh, that's that's not something that I have access to so perhaps that would be a, a question again best put back to government all right we've got time for three more operator could you put through the next caller please Tyler Dawson with the National Post go ahead Tyler. hey uh I just had a question about the hospitalization rate. Um, I'm wondering if you know offhand what the hospitalization rate is for the province, for the Edmonton zone, and for the Calgary zone. Thanks. Uh, I was looking at that today. I don't actually have it in front of me, so we'll have to get back to you on that. But none of those, so neither Edmonton nor Calgary, um, nor the province have crossed that 5% growth threshold. Um, but I, I will we'll have to follow up. I don't have that in front of me. Tyler, we will follow up with you as soon as this media availability is over. Operator, could you put through the next caller, please? Michelle Delfontaine with CBC. Go 
Go ahead, um, Michelle. Hi, Dr. Hitch. Thanks. Uh, hi, Dr. Hinshaw. I just wanted to follow up on Ashley's question. So just to be clear, you don't you don't know who is on that list, the expedited list? I mean, are you on the list? Yes, as I said, I have uh, been granted permission to access rapid testing the times that I've been symptomatic. But again, it's not a decision. I was not asked to designate who was on the list. This was a cabinet decision with those criteria of who would qualify. And it's a group of government officials who works through when there is a situation to determine if that individual qualifies based on that criteria. So again, I don't believe there is a list of names out there. It's a list of criteria. And then it's a government official determination about whether or not an individual would meet that. And it's, a, my understanding, a very small number who've ever accessed that particular uh, expedited testing. All right, we'll go to our final question. Operator, could you put through our last caller? Brittany Gervais with the St. Albert Gazette. Go ahead, Brittany. Hi, Dr. Henshaw. Uh, in St. Albert, uh, we've seen the number of people diagnosed with COVID-19 uh, nearly triple in the last week, from 28 to 76 cases. I'm just wondering if you can comment on this increase and if you're seeing any trends that could maybe explain why we're seeing such a jump. I don't have specific information for St. Albert at this time. What I can say we've seen again across the province is uh, we definitely have seen an impact from Thanksgiving gatherings and we're starting to see numbers where people who acquired it at Thanksgiving perhaps passed it on to others again maybe before knowing they were infectious. So we're starting to see again that kind of double impact in their cases where we're still within the, the tail end of that 14 days from Thanksgiving, but we are starting to see that secondary spread from Thanksgiving cases and the combined uh, impact of those two things I think has um, unfortunately accelerated our growth in some areas where we went into Thanksgiving with higher rates than uh, would have been ideal. Thank you all for joining us today. Dr. Inshaw will provide another update on Monday afternoon. Have a safe Friday and weekend.